Hello. I love that hush. I just like to kind of have the hush for a minute. Uh, welcome. My name is Hilary Harper. I present Life Matters on ABC RN. I'd like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Always was, always will be. A uh, bit of housekeeping, uh, particularly if you have kids with you, yay, welcome, thank you for bringing them. Uh, there are comfy chairs at the back of the room if you need to feed anyone. There's a quiet space upstairs that the ushers can show you to, which has got a microwave and a kettle and more comfy chairs. Uh, and we know that kids make noise, surprise, so don't worry about that. Um, we do ask that you supervise the kids, but they are free to roam around. There's some books and cushions and colouring things over the side. So you could have a go at them too, that's also fine. Uh, and the music that you might have heard coming in is by Claire Tonti from her album Matrescence, which is available from the bookseller handily up in the back corner, you might notice there. The, you might also have seen the community notice board on the wall there, which has got uh, little notes. You can take a note, you can leave a note. And the take a note business is about the thing, you know, that you wish someone had said to you or that you had listened to when they did. If you were grappling with some aspect of motherhood, I um, was like, accept the help. That's the one I should have stuck on the fridge. <laughs> Um, I am so excited to have our guests here with us today. I have had a chilli hot chocolate, but mainly it's just nerves. Uh, Esther Freud, author of nine novels, including Hideous Kinky, and her latest is called I Couldn't Love You More, which is just a generation-spanning look at different modes of motherhood, among other things. Uh, daughter of a famous painter, descendant of a famous psychoanalyst, so art, creativity, Humanity in all its variety is very familiar to her. Edwina Preston is a novelist, a biographer, a musician. You will probably know her book Bad Art Mother, which has become huge, and was just uh, shortlisted, longlisted for the Stella. So go Edwina, it's very exciting watching the, that book um, garner prize listings around the country. And Tando is an incredible soul and R&B artist. Massive festival crowds, I understand, standing ovations, sold out shows at Chapel Off Chapel, the whole lot. Her latest EP is called Life in Colour and you might have seen her on The Voice and also her gorgeous child with her giant headphones in the background during the semi-finals, sleeping through it, amazing. <laughs> So let's get started looking at the, the juggle, the balance, the challenge of uh, motherhood and creativity. Tando, I'll start with you and, and then we'll move on uh, to the others with this question too. What are some of the attitudes that you've encountered when it becomes clear to people that you make not only art but babies? <laughs> um, it's been met with mixed reactions. Um, people within our industry, I think, tend to just sort of assume that once you become a parent, it's kind of over. So like, why would you keep trying to play gigs or keep trying to put yourself out there? Um, my ex and I spent a lot of time building up my career and my live profile, and we obviously both became parents to our daughter. And then there was the question of who was gonna stay home with her if we both had a show on. Obviously he played in my band at the time. Um, when we separated, he would by default look after our daughter while I was performing and it's always the question of who's with Charlie tonight? Who's with Charlie tonight? But if ever he was playing a show and I wasn't there, no one would ever be asking him that. So it was really frustrating. Um, but I think it's, it's, things are changing. I don't know, maybe generational, generationally. Um, I've sort of been doing it for the last 12 years and it's obviously a very different landscape to what it was when we started. We're all getting older, people are starting to settle down and start families, so there's a lot more grace around sort of navigating being a parent and being in that creative space and um, hopefully more grace off, like awarded to mothers who are out playing late night shows and just trust that they've got someone that they trust to look after their child because like why would you like, they're not in the car, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they're with someone that you can trust and, and is safe to be with. But um, it's been very interesting because I was sort of one of the first people in my circle of musician friends to become a mother. So I felt a lot of pressure to sort of lead by example. And I think I might have done a lot more than what I probably needed to to just kind of drive the point home that your career doesn't stop because you become a parent. So... There was a lot of missed times in, in the early stages of my daughter's life and I'm just sort of finding the balance now and trying to make up for it, so. 
I was reading a quote by um, Indigenous singer Emma Donovan who's saying, mm. you know, I was at a rehearsal at the Arts Centre Melbourne recently and there were women doing the backing vocals with the babies in the slings. Oh, I love that. There was a space with colouring books and books for the kid and it was okay for my kid to be there and she said it, it felt amazing mm. but also that's what it should be like. And she said it was so important for her that her daughter could see could her in those that. creative yeah. spaces. Is that what it's like for you too? Absolutely. Like, like I said, things are sort of shifting now. Um, I'm in the position in my career now where I won't accept a show that won't allow me to have my daughter if I wanted to be there. So if I'm doing a festival interstate, you know, part of my contract is that I can have an additional support person there. I can bring my daughter with me or an appropriate accommodations. Call times allow for me to have time with my daughter while I'm away so that I'm spending as minimal time away from her as possible while I've got these engagements. Um, and then it also just sort of instills a level of trust between me and her father that I can take her into state for these things and I'm not just palming her off onto someone else while I'm working. It's, it's about actually having that quality time and having her be as involved in my work as, as she can be. How many of the venues have, like, parenting rooms and stuff? Well, the ones I'm playing now. Um, the ones from 10 years ago, not so much, because we're just <laughs> pubs and really tiny green rooms. Like, you probably wouldn't have a child in there, unless they were quite young and could just sort of settle themselves. But as a toddler, like, obviously, like we would know, like, the, the older your children get, the more attention and stimulation they need, and you can't just stick them in a room while you're doing what you need to do and hope they fend for themselves. Well, but also, um, I mean, your career is really advanced, so you're playing bigger venues, drugier venues now. It must mm. be really hard if someone's starting out in, like, the pub scene, for example. Definitely. Um, and that's something that I always think about for anyone that's sort of starting out now. I think there just needs to be greater access to, you know, for mothers that are coming into that scene. If, if you're not having a close support network of people that can help you look after your child so you can physically go out and do these sorts of shows and then come back, it, it can be like near impossible. I think it's also good for a, a shift in culture, like more daytime gigs, shorter gigs, um, things that are more accessible to parents because then in turn, if your audience can bring their children to your shows, then it's kind of assumed that if you're also a parent who's performing, that there's a facility there for your child to be looked after while you're doing what you need to do. Which is why something like this is awesome because I, I could have had Charlie here. She was here <laughs> earlier, but I thought I would get distracted. <laughs> yeah. That's a new thing. Yeah. Well, and Edwina, you're a musician as well as a writer. So do you have thoughts about, you know, the kinds of attitudes that have greeted you as someone who's doing all the things? Um, I, I thought about a, a lot of my own experiences while I was listening to Tando then and uh, certainly I've got two daughters, one who's 15 and one who's 25 and in my 20s when I was doing music in pubs, I remember the punters club particularly being, you know, very, eight months pregnant and a beer in one hand and there's a picture of me that attests to that documents that moment for history. Um, with my younger one, you know, I was in my 20s, I, I took her to lots of things I remember doing theatre performances and putting her in someone's cello case to have a sleep and <laughs> and I remember doing a, um, a women's show at the Continental which no longer exists in, um, in Paran and I think I, my daughter was five weeks old and she was out the back and I was wearing a beautiful yellow dress but at one point there was this zzzz and I had two enormous big wet spots. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean it was quite fun, I felt like I was pioneering it, you know it was the 90s, I, I was the first one of my friends to have a, a baby and she was an easy baby. Um, with the second one, she's come a couple of times on tour with us, different to Tanto in that a lot of the places, the venues we were playing were small, intimate venues, and she was six when we did the first sort of European tour and eight with the second one. Um, the first one, she, uh, we brought her, my stepson, who was 19, and he kind of looked after her while we were playing. The second time when she was eight, I found it really difficult because I'd be on stage, even the sound check, and I'd be having to kind of keep part of me. I couldn't relax to do the job of being on stage because where was she and who was looking after her and was she in the back room where she said she was going to stay? Or, and what I found very interesting is, number one, my partner, um, did not have that anxiety and was not watching and monitoring her. It was me. And secondly, I was amazed by the way women in the audience just knew and they, they zoned in on her and I'd be on stage and they'd be going, it's okay, she's here. <laughs> so that was, that was really nice. I mean, you know, there's no reason why men couldn't 
do that too, except for, unfortunately, it's more suspect when a man says, it's OK, I've got you to. <laughs> yeah. but, but women really rallied around, and they, they, they could see and they assisted. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot more training of women, I think, to go, we are a village, just yeah. let's all keep an eye. Yeah. Um, to be fair to the men's, because I, I do know a lot of guys who are really trying hard to, to take up the slack and be the, mm. the monitor more these days. Mm. Esther Freud, your book uh, spans like generations of different kinds of mothering, very different kinds of parenthood and mothering. What are your thoughts as you're listening to Tando and Edwina talk today? Well, it's something I thought about so much when I was writing this last novel because I took, um, I, I started out thinking that I wanted to write about love and I ended up really predominantly writing about the love between mothers and daughters particularly. And, um, but I wanted to look at the way people were mothered uh, and, and, and the way that that influenced the way they were able to form their own romantic relationships. So I was kind of writing about romantic love and it kind of edged into... M love for parents and love for children and something that I am very interested in and it probably has sort of seeped into quite a few of my novels um, <clears throat> I took as a sort of useful starting point um, my own grandmother my mother and myself in, in a sort of chronology and I started looking at the way that they um, were sort of able to in, the sort of fashions of the time in terms of their parenting. And so my grandmother w was from an Irish family, my mother's mother, and she was very ambitious to come, to rise up out of what was a very um, rural upbringing. She was the only child in her, in her family to go to secondary school and she would walk, you know, barefoot across the fields and then put her shoes on when she got to the town. And she moved to London and waited through many proposals apparently till she found someone who was ambitious in the way she was but what it meant was when she had her <clears throat> her children my mother was the oldest she sent them off to a boarding convent when they were very little um my mother was seven and her sisters were four and you know i sort of like we all do we just shiver at this idea and they are affected and, and in some ways damaged by it but what they her and my, both my grandparents believed in sort of education would be the way out of what they feared beyond anything, which was poverty. So it's easy for us to kind of... I, I learned so much about them in a way and had so much more sympathy when I realised that, you know, they, they thought they were saving them. As a, I, I have this theory too that every generation really rebels. So they all had children very young and lots of children. And um, I think what my grandparents wanted for them was to wait and, you know, going ideally go into banking and maybe have one or two children chosen and um, so my mother was a teenager when she had me my sister she was 18 I was she had two children by the time she was 20 uh, she was so scared of her parents and the kind of attitude of the time which was that unmarried teenagers women of any age really especially in Ireland but she was living in London by now um, should really be silenced and stopped. And my mother, I always knew that she hadn't told her parents that she had children for years. She'd kept the whole thing a secret. So a relative actually saw her at a bus stop with two little girls and wrote to Ireland saying, we didn't know your daughter was married. <laughs> and then it all began. Um, but by then she was kind of safe. You know, she, her children were old enough. She'd proved that she could do it. I, do you know, I had always known this. And even as I say it now, it kind of made me go, I'd already started writing my novel and I went, oh, I have my plot. I hadn't kind of realized that. Um, and so in a way, my book then diverges totally from the truth because I wanted to show what it would have been like for a woman who didn't get away with it as my mother did. And then, then what was actually, oddly enough, the most difficult part of, the, uh, of my research and to, to set someone in my own lifetime, someone bringing up children in the 90s, um, who tries to do it perfectly. And their rebellion is not to be the kind of casual, I'll take my child to any festival, put them in the jello case of my mother's thing, but to do it so that you are making a, you know, a collage from pasta at every opportunity, <laughs> etc. however difficult your life is. And I feel that I've grown up with women who are 
obsessed with taking their babies to baby gymnastics and you know dance classes and music for babies and and not actually just saying we're going to be creative in the house whatever i want to do you can tag along which i now kind of feel more inclined to and wish i had my time again to do that more i was really interested by the way art kind of um functions in <coughs> your novel because the middle generation the one who is navigating those assumptions about what women should and shouldn't do with their reproduction in the 60s um is having an affair with a, an artist who turns out to be quite a successful artist and the woman in the 90s is an artist but she's struggling to do her art amongst you know the domestic load and the difficult relationship and the difficult employment situations so i imagine that your uh, grandparents must have think, thought art no that's that's the opposite of banking and we don't want any of that in our lives how did art complicate things in your family well it had a huge impression and we were talking about this earlier actually i was talking with tando about creativity and motherhood and um i i, I had two very separate um influences so my father who i drew on for my character in the book um to to good a character to resist and um i so i was given the example of someone who put art at the very front of their life um he he kind of showed his children that if you could make your life work from your insides that would be the highest and most pleasurable way to exist he he made it look pretty damn fun <laughs> but he also made it the most important thing in his life he said i'm entirely selfish that's how i am and i'm going to do what i need to do so my mother because someone has to pick up the slack um was very creative but as life went along so you know we'd move into some virtually derelict place she would repaper the walls and put lino down find some furniture in a skip reupholster the sofa it was so inspiring and impressive but it didn't have any validation really so there was my father sort of hero worship my mother kind of slightly disapproved of for having got herself into this mess so i was pretty conflicted by these two versions of creativity well and that idea of selfishness is really interesting in bad art mother it it comes up all the time you know what kind of mother am i i feel guilty for taking this opportunity at one point she is allowed to kind of or encouraged to farm her child out to a, a different couple uh vida the the main character of this incredible novel um what are your thoughts around that idea of of how women engage with the idea of selfishness when it comes to art and creativity i think it's really hard i think it's not something that you can it's conditioned into us it's a part of our making of who we are you know it's it's difficult i mean i was doing a lot of reading about the 19th century ideas about women writers and there was this there was this idea called books versus babies you could have one or the other it was also described as the menopausal theory of um of literary practice because you could become a novelist once your children had grown up and gone away and you it was like you had finite energies you couldn't do both because if you put it into your books your children would lose out if you put it into your children you'd write second rate books so i think that's always been a quandary and i was also thought a lot about um a book by drusilla majeska that's came out about 20 years ago called stravinsky's lunch and it was essentially it was a biography of two australian turn of the century artists grace cossington smith and stella bowen um stella bowen had a married ford madox ford and and hung out with gertrude stein in paris and had this very very public um you know connected life grace cossington smith became an excellent painter by withdrawing and really not marrying and and just harboring this private artistic practice but the title came from stravinsky who who commanded total silence at lunch time from his family so that his state of mind when he was composing would not be interrupted and that the idea around all this was that women cannot or, or most women would not feel like either they were able to request such a thing nor that they wanted to that idea that actually the two things can 
And then I started looking at more work that was talking about the idea that actually, do you need a room of one's own? Do you need to lock your children out? Can women lock their children out from their creative practice and feel okay about that? I can't. And so that's sort of where some of those ideas came from and what society will think of you if you do, because we excuse selfishness in male artists, but I think we find it much harder to do the same for, for women artists. Well, and there are musicians in, in these books, Tando, too, the male musicians and artists who are like, I just I have to put everything aside for my art, you know, I really need to. Is that an attitude that you've had to deal with? You know, that like if you're a genius, <laughs> you're a really, really good musician, then mm. you can get away with this stuff if you're a man, but if you're a woman, it's a bit more complicated? It's really complicated. Um, the motherhood guilt thing is something that I've been battling with a lot. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, there was a lot of missed time in the early years of my daughter's life because I'd obviously away touring or playing gigs and I feel like I'm only just now starting to, to find that balance. Um, I'm really lucky in that I've cultivated such an incredible network of women that have helped me raise my daughter. Um, when my partner and I first became parents, it was a harder reality for him to accept. So I just kind of took control of the parenting journey for the both of us, just to, you know, minimise the amount of change on his side of things. That obviously made things really difficult because I was obviously working on my career and, and trying to find the balance of being a mother at the same time. Um, about a year after Charlie was born was sort of the start of the pandemic. And obviously that took away a lot of you know, a lot of opportunities as a performer. So I had nothing else happening in my life apart from being a mother. And I realized how hard it was. And I just felt, like, I love my daughter. Please do not get me wrong when I say the next thing I'm about to say, but <laughs> it, I, I felt incredibly uninspired and unlike myself. Like I didn't know who I was because I didn't have my creative outlet. And because we were in lockdown and she couldn't go to daycare and we couldn't see family and friends, I didn't have five minutes to myself to even just sit down at my instrument or write or create anything until she'd gone to bed. And then she'd go to bed and then, you know, I've got a pile of laundry to do, I've got dishes to do, I've got other things to just sort of keep life going for all of us. And, you know, I had to then find my creativity in my mothering um, so I started like trying to write children's songs and, you know, obviously I'd have her in my lap, we'd be at the piano together and you know, she'd press a bunch of keys and then we would try and write a song together through that way. And it was just a very small way that I could just reconnect with who I was before I became a parent because I was so determined not to lose that, that when the pandemic happened, it was like, well, no, this is the reality of your life and you're going to have to figure out how to be the best mother that you can be so that you can in turn be the best artist you can be when you come out on the other side of it. And, you know, I feel my songwriting has become a lot more um, introspective or a lot more honest because I had to go through that battle of having that taken away from me to be able to be honest and be vulnerable in my music in a way that I never had the opportunity to before. And you know, now that I know that my, my artistic or my personal identity is not reliant on being a mother does not define me, being an artist does not define me, it's just part of the tapestry of who I am as a whole person and that's allowed me to make creative decisions that allow me to be able to obviously have my daughter alongside with me in this process. I mean, she's older now as well, so it's definitely made it a lot easier and she has more of an understanding of what my function is in life and that when I'm giving to her, I'm giving to her as Tando, her mother, not Tando, the artist. But if she can come and be a part of this, you know, whatever inspiration she can draw from it, um, to just serve a positive role in her life. Like I want her to see me doing what I'm doing and know that it's possible to just do what you set your mind to, whatever that looks like for her. You know, if, if she wants to be an artist too, or she wants to be an astronaut or a doctor or whatever it is, just to know that sheer resilience and determination gets you to where you want to get. And that's why it's important to me to just keep doing it, even when it gets hard. Um, what was the question? I reckon. <laughs> You've answered so it like and several other questions also. 
I just I noticed a quote by Beyonce. She said, after she had her first child, I truly understood my power and motherhood has been my biggest inspiration. And my first thought was support staff. You've got like this giant, you know, that is so great. That's what it should be like for all of us. But I bet it's about the domestic load as well as the actual fact of motherhood. Do you feel like that's that's been a, a part of what's happening for you? It's, it's a, I feel like something about motherhood is about the fragmentation of your consciousness and yeah. that distraction and part of it is just about the laundry. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, my life has become significantly easier since I left my ex. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> Hello. No, honestly, it's just the battling. So, you know, things like, you know, carrying the mental load, I think because now there's a more equal distribution of time, like we're, we're time splitting. It's 50-50. So he gets her half the week, I get her the other half. So when I don't have her, I just have to budget my time. You know, there's a portion of that that's used towards all my creative projects, writing, rehearsing, you know, teaching. Then the other half is literally cleaning my house. <laughs> And then I know that when I do have her for the other half of the week and the weekend, I'm not worrying about the laundry. I'm not worrying about dishes. I've done my meal prep. So the time that we spend together is genuine quality time and then getting to know who she is as a person. And I'm, I'm obviously not encouraging anyone to, to do that, but <laughs> I think communication with, you know, with your partner that you're raising your child with is so, so, so important. And just to understand how a distribution of those responsibilities really does go a long way and you know I obviously battled for a really long time as to whether I would be able to raise my child without his support and it, it did turn out that it was easier because it also gave him an opportunity to step up as a parent and to assume responsibility you know the split custody was his idea I left the relationship assuming that I would have full custody of my daughter and I sort of set my life up to have that so I didn't actually know what to do with myself when we decided to go 50-50 because I didn't, I had nothing else happening. It was either gigs or being a mother, but I'd sort of, sort of um, had to find time for myself to do things that make me happy. So, you know, my nails are always done now because I've got time to go to the nail salon. <laughs> um, just, you know, self-care and, and looking after my mental health. You know, I've got time to go to therapy. I've got time to spend with my family and it's, just so incredibly important as mothers to look after ourselves first because you can't pour out of an empty cup and that was the biggest lesson that I learned and same thing with my creative process I didn't have any inspiration to continue creating when I was in lockdown because it was either the domestic work or being a mother there was no time for me to connect with myself and be able to articulate the things that I was feeling with that deprivation of a creative outlet so even when I did have like you know an hour during her nap to sit at the piano and try and write something or create something. It was like trying to get blood out of a stone. There was just, there was nothing. And yeah, I realised the importance of being able to, to fill my own cup so that I can genuinely give something real. Yeah, it is a weirdly radical act, isn't it? Going, I might go for a walk like now and mm. eat cereal for tea if I feel like it because no kids are watching me. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I want to talk about Vida and her story for a moment because um, there's so many different ways of mothering in this book, all centred mm. on Owen, the one child, mm. and there's so many different ways of doing art as well, or not mm. doing art, refusing to have anything to do with creativity. Can you talk a bit about Vida and Mrs Parrish and perhaps Ornella, the... Mm. Um, Vida, the, the kind of tortured poet who really struggles with the domestic load and, and what parenting means for her. Mrs Parrish, the more wealthy, privileged, childless person who takes some responsibility for Owen but still wants to do art. And Ornella, who does a lot of the mothering of Owen and does mm. no art whatsoever. Mm. Mm. Well, um, I mean, the, the Ornella character is, um, she at one point in the book says, I don't have a creative bone in my body, which is something my mother actually said. I stole that directly from, from my mother's <laughs> mouth. Good um, writer. My father was a, an, an artist and art lecturer. My mother pr prided herself on not having a creative bone in her body. Um, but um, so I sort of had those two forces in my own life. But I was also thinking about the way different temperaments, different scenarios, there are, there's another female artist who does get success in the book who has a relationship with another woman ultimately and doesn't have children. And so I was sort of trying to look at, you know, making art with children, without children, in heterosexual relationships, outside of them, what are the differences? And there are different struggles for women 
regardless. And the book is set in the in the 60s, so just to give it that context, it was deliberately in a kind of proto-feminist period. There's one point where Vida reads um, the, the 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 Betty Friedan book. Someone help me with the oh, time. Yeah. Is it the what's it called? The, the feminist mistake is that feminine mistake. That's feminine right. mistake. So, because that, so all this stuff was starting to bubble and percolate through. But also, you know, Vita's a, a sort of a tortured character in a way. And I'd, um, I, I'd read the absolutely magnificent correspondence of the Australian poet Gwen Harwood. Um, she is such an interesting, mischievous character, and her her letters are just alive. And she, the ultimate, I, I won't spoil, no, I won't do a spoiler, but there is a, there's a kind of a, a hoax occurs at the end of my book, which is taken directly from something that, that Gwen Harwood did in the 60s, a literary hoax. Um, but Gwen Harwood was made of stern and solid stuff, and she overcame the fallout from her hoax and went on to become one of Australia's best and, and most well-respected poets. But I wanted to, I sort of thought about, well, what a different woman of a different temperament that scenario could have destroyed them. So that's sort of where that character, well, that's where she ended up, and it was that sort of journey to get there. Well, and I wonder too how much it was about the struggle to make the art, you know. I mean, um, Vida talks about feeling so guilty and so relieved that, that when Owen is young, she's relieved for half the week mm. of the grizzling and the whining mm. and the feeding mm. and the wiping and the nappies and all that um, earthy business of parenting. Mm. Um, but, she, you know, she's really quite contrasted with Mrs Parrish because she's struggles so hard to get recognised for the art that she does make mm. as well, mm. whereas Mrs Parrish... Is, struggles a lot too, but in the end there is some recognition and Owen says art made Mrs Parrish calm and strong. Mm. Art didn't do that for Vida. Mm, mm. So it's not just about the, the parenting, is it? It's about other things going on. Yeah, I mean, and Mrs, Mrs Parrish is an Ikebana artist, so she's dealing with flowers and as we all know, flowers have never been a particularly, um, you know, um, valuable subject for the making of art. Um, so that that was sort of deliberate, but she finds her she finds her way through, and she travels to Japan, and she leaves leaves her domineering husband, and it's actually we see him struggle. And I really didn't want it I didn't want it to be a a book where you know the the male characters are punished. I, he is sort of punished in the end by her leaving him, but I had sympathy for him too. Mm. Um, the men so, are really interesting in your novel, actually. Like sorry? Not, the men are really interesting. They're not, you know, cut and paste gender stereotypes. They're real, real people operating within the strictures of the time, just like the women are. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I kind of felt like I was walking a delicate balancing, doing a, you know, a balancing act with that because I, I didn't want to just say, you know, famous poet, brute to his wife, evil man. Like, there's subtleties going on. He's vulnerable, he's susceptible, he struggles, he's a product of his times. So, so I'm glad that came through. I'm glad that he's not two-dimensional. Yeah. But he, he loses his wife, ultimately. Yeah. yeah. He has had, you know, an affair on the way. So that, is true. I, <laughs> that is true. That is true. Esther, can we talk a bit about the 60s? Because sometimes it feels like the, the way the 60s is presented in your book is a, a kind of distillation of how things still kind of are. Would you care to talk about that? Um, in terms of roles, Gender relationships, gen yeah. yeah. Attitudes to women well, being involved you know, in any creative endeavour. I found as a mother and a writer um, in the 90s and, you know, in the beginning of this century, I sometimes, I sometimes used to think, nothing has changed. Um, the role, gender roles seem to be so fixed. And that, you know, I was also, it was so hard to know how much I was bringing to it and accepting it, how much I was get, gathering from looking around me, but it seemed very challenging. And, um, yeah, I, I just remember once listening to a radio program about kind of, you know, the, the sort of beginnings of feminism and, and this was sort of in the, in the four, 30s and 40s and people breaking through and, and I just remember rising up in this kind of state of fury and streaking through and saying, nothing has changed, you know, and sort of knowing that, um, that the workload seemed just endless 
and, um, and that I couldn't really see apart from separating, which I fantasized about. I used to have a file on my computer, <laughs> Dreams of Escape. And it, I felt that then I would get a break because presumably the father of my children would have to step up and have them sometimes. And I'd seen that in relationships where they'd parted and then the, the father who never seemed to particularly take any response suddenly was appalled, heartbroken and would have them every other weekend. I'd be like, oh my God, can you imagine? So I was, I was really curious about all of these things and put a lot of this. This novel was so long at one point. <laughs> it's about 500 pages. I was like trying to cut it back. I had so much to say. And, um, but I think that I just hope when I look at younger part couples, I do see changes. I'm really hopeful that, that there will be changes. But I was going to say that I was, I was brought up very much with this idea that work was a god. And it was to be, it was to be whispered and tiptoed around. And that story about the composer where there's silence at the table, as far as my father's incredible creativity and talent. We admired it as, as I'm glad, as, as it needed to be admired, but he set the rules. And I think that I took those with me so that the men I was with, I, I appreciated their desire for work. And, and however difficult things were, if it was work, I'd think, oh, it's work. Whereas my own work, I was able to be, I was able to be more flexible. There's this dangerous thing about being a writer and a woman is I thought, well, I could do it tomorrow. I could guess I could do it next week. I didn't feel, I didn't find it very easy to, to kind of hold my boundary under the face of work, someone else's need. And I remember once my, I think I just had my third child and lots of very difficult things were happening and my, my partner had to go suddenly to America for some important, possibly life-changing job, of course, came to nothing. But um, I remember, my <laughs> well, my mother, my, I said to my mother, do you think you could come and, and help? And, and she, she, I remember her looking at me and go, does he, does he have to go? And we kind of looked at each other and there was a silence. It seems he does. <laughs> and I was scared of interrupting that. I'd, I'd, I'd been well-trained to walk on those eggshells. I don't think it's easy to change yourself so fundamentally when you've had a whole childhood of that. So yeah. I, I, I try not to sort of hold that really with any grievance. It's just how it was. And of course, I was then attracted to people who cared hugely about their own work because that's what was familiar to me. I remember when we spoke on Life Matters a week or so ago, you said things got a lot easier when you worked out how to ask for what you needed. I need five to eight hours a day of writing and then everything is fine. Was it really that easy? Well, you, you, no. And um, because actually <laughs> in that conversation, it was Rachel Yoda who we talked about the end of her book. She either seemed to have a choice in her novel of turning into a a, a night bitch, a dog, and running wild with a pack, or saying, could I have some more help? <laughs> uh, I just think that's a great quandary. But I do think it's really hard to ask when someone doesn't want to say yes. It's like, don't ask for what you're not going to get. It makes it even worse. So, but I do think, I do think, um, I do think, I used to try and manage with as little as possible and think, oh, I'm saving some money here. What I discovered eventually was, use all your resources to get as much support as you can. It makes a huge difference to everybody. Um, and give up on asking people for help who don't want to help you. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah. yep, you very quickly work it out, don't you, from the look in their eyes. Mm. Yeah. Now, we will have a little bit of time for questions afterwards. So if you have questions for Tanda or Edwina or Esther, save them up, stick your hands up, and we'll get to you. Um, but I've got more for the moment, so hold fire. Um, you, you talked before, Esther, about the, the different ways of being creative with kids, not having to kind of, you know, have the spreadsheet with the, the activity schedules across the week, but just let's whack some pasta on some cardboard today. I mean, it, there are benefits too, aren't there, of having a creative or several creative people in the house for kids. Like, having art in your life somehow is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I got, I got this kind of thrown back in my face a bit because I have two boys and a girl, and my daughter was so creative that sometimes I used to say, stop, please, can you watch TV? It was so funny. I tried to kind of put that a little bit into the Freya character, the youngest of the 
four women in this story. And she was just, all she wanted to do was like, drag home some wood from the park and paint it in murals. Or she, once I was trying, especially late at night when she was, I was trying to get her to bed, it'd be like quarter to 10 and she'd say, once she said, I've got an idea for a new alphabet. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was like, am I going to say no? <laughs> <laughs> and it went, and it made me laugh so much. So she was just, you know, it was quite, it was quite marvelous, really. And she is, her life is, she has her own little business making things. And she, you know, it, she got all the genes, just bam, you know. <laughs> when I'm obsessed by this idea of selfishness and how we deal with it because I was actually reflecting when, when I left my partner, one of the great moments of calm and gratitude was like, I have so much time for work now. I don't have that fragmentation three and a half days a week. I can focus. I was like, oops, sorry, I left you for my job. <laughs> Not actually true. But, you know, it, it, was, it was a revelation to me how important that was to me and how how much I'd struggle with not having it. Um, I wonder, Tanda, where do you draw your energy from? Because even with the three and a half days a week of yeah. quiet time, it still takes a lot, doesn't it, to be a public persona performing, collaborate with other people, parent, laundry. Yeah. I mean, look, I just try to make every moment as present as possible. Um, if there's an opportunity to sit and reflect, and this is part of what I've been learning with my therapist, is just how to actually be in the moment. And one thing that I've always struggled with is just looking too far in the future and not appreciating where I'm at in the moment. Just think about, you know, how's the situation going to pan out in the next five years? Okay, I'm planning for the next five years. I'm saving this, I'm doing that, instead of actually just, yeah, sitting in and smelling the flowers and enjoying the fruits of, of my labour. So I think it really just comes down to having a moment of reflection and gratitude. And obviously because of my circumstances, I'm, I'm offered the opportunity to have that and I definitely take, take stock of that. And anything that I create now as a result of being able to have those moments has, I think it's just more, more of a cathartic thing for me as opposed to like, I'm writing this song because this is something that I need to say. It's really just an opportunity for release. And, you know, if there's something salvageable for a record or something, then it ends up on there. Um, I, I don't sit down to write a song for the sake of having a song about X, Y, Z anymore. I literally just let my subconscious speak through my art. And if it's worth putting out, then I'll put it out. Um, I don't do anything with a strategy anymore. Again, things are not really... Because um, I'm doing it for me now, you know. Um, there's Obviously, there's a lot of work to do and, and still, you know, cutting my teeth and establishing who, like, what my identity is in this industry. But I've just found the best way to, you know, enjoy it is just to be honest with myself and just do the things that make me feel good. And I'm not doing anything on anyone's terms. You know, I'm not signed to a label, so I literally just, if I don't want to do a thing, I'm just going to say no. Because if I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. Um, or if I do want to do something, I could just put 100% of myself into it. And, you know, that's including that creative process. I think being able to have genuine moments of connection with my daughter, though, are the thing that reminds me why I do it. As I know my approach to my career and everything that I do now is, there's so much more of a purpose behind everything that I do. And, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to be in the moment, but I also can't help but think of what my legacy is going to be and what I'm leaving behind for her. And, you know, if I don't end up having any more children in my life, I just want to make sure that she's, she knows that she was loved and she's surrounded by family and people that, you know, appreciate who she is and will always protect her and that everything that I did was to inspire her and was for her. So... Like, she's, she's at the essence of what I do. I, I don't know what kind of artist I would be or I don't know what kind of person I would be if I didn't become a mother when I did. I had my daughter at 26, and for my mother that was old because <laughs> she had me quite young. Um, but obviously in my circle of friends, like, being the first person, I wasn't even in my 30s yet, and they were like, how are you going to manage being a mother and having a child, you know, you're, you're barely barely in your 20s at this stage and things are just getting started. Like, don't you think that you're throwing it all away? And I was obviously really worried about that at the beginning, but 
I also knew that I didn't really have any, I didn't have any real inspiration until life happened. And becoming a mother has just changed my whole world and has changed my worldview on a lot of things and things that I was so passionate about before mean something totally different to me now. And you, know, you think about the way that you're gonna raise your children and you don't wanna, you don't wanna ruin them. You know, you don't wanna create you don't want to raise a dickhead, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes you reflect on the person that you are and what you put out into the world and, and how you move through the world and how people perceive you. And you, you want to be a good example. And, you know, a lot of things have changed in the last five years of my life um, as a result of becoming a mother. So, yeah, just want to do good in the world and have her be proud of me, essentially. It's yeah. really interesting to contrast what you've just said with um, Vita's experience in this book because you can see that she is so constrained by the circumstances of her life. But she really wrestles with these questions of, you know, what kind of mother am I? What is best for my child? Would I give up poetry if I felt it was doing harm to Owen? I hope that I would make the right decision, mm. but I would resent it forever mm. and I would mm. become this screaming, injured banshee who would ruin everyone around her. Mm. That's a hard thing to be. And was it a hard thing to write about too, that that. Well, I mean, sometimes I, you know, just in a, I, I think of, you know, what choice would I make if somebody said to me, you know, your book could be a huge bestseller and win prizes or, you know, something might happen to your child. It was just a no-brainer. But, it, it, well, actually it wasn't a no-brainer. <laughs> it was actually a difficult thing to contemplate. And, um, you know, I, I, it was hard. And, of course, you're never forced to make that choice in real life, but it's just a sort of a theoretical conundrum. But, um, you know, I, I also think, and maybe... There's, there's moments when Vita does this, but I was thinking about what Tando was just saying and, and the way in which when you have a child, it actually makes you get in touch with your own childlike sense of play. You have to have this enforced patience. Like I remember going to the bloody kids' playground, right? <laughs> <laughs> which can be really boring, but the first time around, you know, I'd go, okay, I'm going to have to play this imaginative game for 45 <laughs> minutes. And you have to give yourself over to it, and in giving yourself over to it, you actually find this creative play yourself, and that's kind of the lesson that kids can teach you, which is good for your creativity. And I remember reading or hearing Spike Milligan's daughter speak about um, him just making a walk to the shop, this creative enterprise. And I mean, I don't know if I've always been able to do that with my daughters, probably with the, the first one more, because I had less burdens on me when I was younger and I could engage in much more play with her. Um, but it is, I mean, that's... It, it does force you to be still and it does force you to go into their worlds and I think that's the expansive thing. Like, you know, no one talks about how motherhood's really good for art, but it actually is in that sense, I think. Well, but you're right in the book. Evita says you, you need playfulness and lassitude. Yeah. You need that kind of sense of calm and relaxation, which is sometimes a bit inimical yeah. to motherhood, isn't it? Mm. Or, or the work of motherhood, anyway. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Esther, I wonder if I can put this to you. Can you make good art without messing up your kids? Because that is a theme of some of these books. Well, there's a sort of famous um, saying of the pram in the hall. I, <clears throat> once you have that pram, that's the end. And that was actually said by a man, and I felt it was for other men. And I think the pressure of having to raise money, etc., <clears throat> which is a whole other subject, um, of responsibility, but I think for me the pram in the hall was galvanizing. It was what I had really wanted, so to get what you want is a glorious feeling. I wanted to have children, I was so happy to have them. The pram in the hall may, I was laughing at your, I need five to eight hours. I was like, can I have three hours? Three hours, I was like, the dream of three hours. You could get so much done when you only have three hours. Um, in a way, now I have all day, I don't get so much more done. Um, it's, it's great for your discipline. And I also wanted to be playful, and I wanted to kind of revisit that time. Um, but what was your question? Uh, can, can you I, can you make good art? Can you make without damaging? Yeah. Well, does I, it depend you know, who you are? Mm, I I think that 
I don't think you can be a parent without damaging your kids just somewhere along the way, just whether you're making art or not, because, because you feel guilty so easily. And I just, when I heard you talk about guilt, I was like, must eradicate guilt. It's just such a pointless uh, emotion to hold on to. And occasionally I just get assailed by it and I just really try and let it go. Um, you know, the idea that we're sort of having it all uh, this is a big phrase over the last 20 years that women makes you makes you think as well superstitiously that you can't have it all so that if something goes well you will suffer on some other level or that your children will suffer and i don't think having it all ever um was something that was fixed on to men men could have a great job and be successful and have children like why not but i certainly felt when my first book was successful maybe this will mean i won't have children or you know it's like I, had, I was really paranoid that you I wouldn't be allowed that my portion of what I was allowed in life would just be this big mm -hmm. and I had to really work on that superstition to, to let that go I do think that um, when I think about my father and how how honest he was about I have to do this this is what I have to do and I, I'm selfish he would say it not as a criticism of him he just said, I just want you to know, I'm entirely selfish, so I'm going to have to do this. It was actually quite, it was quite um, helpful. You knew where you stood. And it wasn't also entirely true, because he did give a lot. But you could, within that, he inspired his children so much. I learnt my discipline from him. As a writer, it often takes a lot longer when I'm teaching creative writing. People struggle with discipline so much. They have an amazing story to tell. But to be able to sit down at a time that's that is your best time for writing not in the middle of the night when you've done everything else and you've left it to last but to find that in yourself I learned from him so for the for the other things that maybe were more difficult that was a gift that I appreciate so and um, yeah I saw as well that he didn't give up easily. If things were going badly, he didn't think, oh, I can't do this, I'm rubbish. He just went on and on, and I learned that if you put the 10,000 hours into something, something will come out. Yep, yeah. When I hear the phrase having it all, I often think of the, the Greek philosophers. It's like, yep, they made great philosophy. They had slaves. So, I don't know. Causation or correlation? Don't know. Uh, do we have questions? If so, stick a hand up and someone will come and find you with the microphone. Selfishness, genius. Yes, we have a question. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you for speaking. It's been really inspiring hearing about your creative practices. Um, this is a question for Esther and Edwina. I'm just wondering how your relationship with your work um, has changed as your children have grown older. Um, it's been so interesting just in this last year because my youngest child reached 18 and I had so much more time. And for the first time in, in 35 years, I didn't have a burning idea. I thought this is so unfair. <laughs> and it kind of made me glad as well that when they were little and I felt time was so precious and I sometimes do, do feel guilty that I was so desperate to finish whatever I was doing. But those were the books I had to write then. Like if I'd saved them till now, they would have evaporated. So um, I spoke to somebody kind of therapeutic who said, inspiration's just giving you a little rest. Just take that, sit with it, you know, be patient. And so I did actually coming away on, I've, been, I've been in Melbourne for a few months. I've had so many new ideas. I just needed to take a breath. For so long, I was desperately finishing a book because I had another idea that I couldn't wait to start. And it was a strange sensation and, and quite um, scary not to have that. But I, I think sometimes you just have to sit with it. And I hadn't really had time to sit with anything. So, yeah, but thank you. In the mid twenties, person. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I when my children were young, I I didn't. I was so exhausted when they had their naps that every time, you know, and, and they wouldn't go to sleep unless I lay down next to them and pretended to be asleep myself. <laughs> so I ended up thinking I have this time when they're napping, and I never did because I slept too. And I used to feel guilty about that. It seems insane now, but but I did. Oh, I'm so bad. I should be, you know. No, it was actually important for me to to snuggle up with my child and and have that nap. Um, but um, 
I was thinking of something, Esther, you were talking about your, your children being older and time not having that preciousness. And there was, and all these things that I sort of thought about, um, and um, the, the German expressionist artist, Kath Kolwitz, is that how you pronounce her, her name? Anyway, there's a quote from her, and she talks about how when her kids had grown up and no longer needed her, and she had all the time in the world, she felt, she said, I work like a cow grazes. <laughs> You know, there's I, maybe I get a little bit more done than I did before, but actually all that time and not having that that intensity of dealing with them is that actually took away the preciousness of the time that she actually had to work. And I can, and so I, and I was talking to Esther about this earlier and saying how I, I sort of, when I don't have structured time, I do less and less and less. And I know I actually work better if I say, okay, I've got this hour every day and that's it. Use it or don't, but, but that's my time and, and I, I don't, I, I tend to, yeah, work like a cow grazes if I've got too much time on my hands. Sometimes when young writers ask for advice, I say, make a start time and a stop time and stick to it. Do not go on even when things are gripping you. Um, wait and then you'll be ready to start in the morning. Mm. Mm. Next question? Nope. We have like a minute left. <laughs> no, okay, good. Uh, I want to quickly ask one before we wrap up. Um, Edwina, there was this lovely, lovely line in your book. At one point, Vita uh, changes tack and Owen says, she stopped trying to be a mother in the respectable, normal way or in the struggling, slightly desperate way. Hello. And as a result, things were much more relaxed. We were just incidental companions on summer holidays together. Do you mm. think it would be better if we reimagined motherhood a bit like that? Is that possible? Well, I think we, we feel like, you know, it can be really nice. I re I'd always hoped that one of my daughters would be a big reader because I had this ideal image of us just lazing on beach towels together, just each reading our, our own novel. And that's kind of what I was getting to, that, you know, incidental companions, having time, not having all those structured activities, keeping them busy constantly. Um, there's, there's part, of, obviously as a mother you can't always be like that and you can't be your, your child's incidental companion. There's so much more involved and you can't be their friend in the same way. I, I felt quite lucky um, because I've got a daughter who's 10 years older than the younger one so that I know that there's this extra loop so the older, the older daughter plays a mothering role to the younger daughter and often I get things that the older daughter is a conduit for me to find out things that are going on that I should be alerted to with the younger one. So I've kind of got this, this interesting, the relation, it, it works, it's good. And um, so, so, you know, I'd, I'd still like them to read more novels, including my own, which they haven't. <laughs> Yeah, uh, many questions unanswered, but we do need to wrap up. Thank you all so much, Esther, Edwina, Tando, for sharing your stories with us today. Thank you for coming and thank you for crying in the background because if only all audiences communicated that way to us when they were ready to go, that would be great. <laughs> um, Neighbourhood Books is selling the books up the back. You'll be able to buy signed copies at the signing table. And I'm like contractually required, but also feel like I really want to say this, you're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. It was so beautiful.